Good afternoon and welcome to our congressional briefing on the report, The State of Obesity 2021, Better Policies for a Healthy America, hosted by Trust for America's Health, or TIFA for short. My name is Tim Hughes, the External Relations and Outreach Manager at TIFA. We would like to thank our speakers and audience for being with us today. Next slide, please. Let's see. Real-time captioning is provided today by AI Media Services. For captions, click on more at the bottom right of your screen with the three dots. Next, click on closed caption. Next slide, please. We encourage you all to share your thoughts and questions about today's presentation by typing them in the Q&A box. We'll try to answer as many as we can as time permits. To open the Q&A box, click the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. From there, select enter when you're ready to submit your question. Next slide. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our moderator of this event, Dr. J. Nadine Gracia. Dr. Gracia is the president and CEO of Trust for America's Health. She is a national health equity leader with extensive leadership and management experience in federal government, the nonprofit sector, academia, and professional associations. As president and CEO, she leads TIFA's work to advance sound public health policy, address the social determinants of health, advance health equity, and make health promotion and disease prevention a national priority. Welcome, Dr. Gracia. Thank you, Tim, and greetings, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for this important discussion. As Tim noted, my name is Nadine Gracia, and I'm the president and CEO of Trust for America's Health. I'd first like to welcome all of you in the audience for joining us today, as well as our esteemed panelists for taking the time to participate in this important briefing. We are so honored that you are here with us today. Next slide, please. So the agenda for today's briefing includes a high level overview of TIFA's 2021 State of Obesity Report Findings and Recommendations, followed by a special discussion with a virtual fireside chat with the renowned chef Jose Andres. We'll then have presentations by our three esteemed panelists, and then we'll have time for question and answer with our audience. To begin, I'd like to provide an overview of the key findings and recommendations from the State of Obesity Report. And this is our, our 18th annual report on the obesity crisis in the United States. A copy of the full report, including state-specific information, is available on our website at tifa.org, and we'll also include a link in the chat. Our goals for today's briefing is that you learn the latest data and trends in, in obesity in the United States and glean some concrete policy recommendations and examples to really address the structural and systemic drivers of obesity, the social and economic conditions that contribute to this growing pandemic. Next slide, please. So let me begin with some framing to note that as we are addressing obesity, it is truly because it is a serious chronic disease. Obesity is unfortunately common and has significant health as well as economic costs, where it puts a strain on families, it affects overall health, increases healthcare costs, and, and affects productivity, and actually even impacts our military readiness. So this is a focus, not simply on a person's size, but on how to promote healthy weight to pre prevent the serious consequences of obesity, which includes an increased risk for many conditions, such as blood pressure, stroke, and Obesity rates have been rising, as you can see on this slide, for decades. And sadly, in 2017 to 2018, that was the first year where the national rate of adult obesity passed the 40% mark at 42.4%. To put that into context, in 2012, there were no states uh, with adult obesity rates over 35%. And yet in 2020, 16 states had adult obesity rates at or above 35%, uh, which uh, in this slide you can see is demarcated by the states in red. And that's an increase from 12 states in 2019. Not only are we at a record high, we have reached this high at a very quick pace. In 2000, West Virginia was the state with the highest level of adult obesity with a rate of 23.9%. Now in 2020, Colorado 
was the state with the lowest rate of obesity at 24.2%. So in just 20 years, the ceiling has become the floor. Now the state with the lowest rate of obesity matches the state with the highest rate of obesity from 20 years ago, with the 2020 ceiling being 39.7% in Mississippi. Next slide, please. We also know that there are significant racial and ethnic disparities in rates of obesity. And although, although the data are not shown on this slide, adults with lower incomes, with lower educational levels, and in rural areas and counties are also more likely to have obesity. Now, it's critically important to underscore that these disparities are inexorably linked with the social, economic, and environmental conditions in communities. As you're gonna hear further from our panelists, obesity is a chronic disease with many contributing factors, including access to affordable, healthy foods, the built environment and design of neighborhoods, and access to safe places for physical activity. And the disparities are a manifestation of longstanding structural and systemic inequities, such as multi-generational poverty, discrimination, and the lack of community conditions that actually promote health. Next slide, please. Now, similar to adults, the rate of children with obesity is also rising. In 2018, children ages two to 19 had the highest rate of obesity ever documented at 19.3%. And since 1976, childhood obesity rates have more than tripled. Addressing adult ch childhood obesity is incredibly important because preventing obesity is easier and more effective among children than trying to reverse those trends later in life. This is why so many policies and programs are focused at the school and preschool levels. Next slide, please. So this year's State of Obesity Report focuses on the social determinants of health, and how those social determinants impact obesity as well as COVID-19. Now this slide depicts the linkages between the historical to present day social, economic and policy contexts that can impact people's lives and the opportunities and choices that are available to them. And these social, economic and environmental factors can also increase a person's risk for obesity. Next slide, please. Now, since the early days of the pandemic, it has exposed the overlapping crisis of chronic disease and COVID-19, with obesity being among the underlying medical conditions that are associated with more severe disease and complications from COVID-19. A recent study from the Journal of the American Heart Association estimated that about 30% of the adult COVID-19 hospitalizations through November 2020 were attributable to obesity. And as we examine the social determinants you know, these conditions in which we are born, where we grow, work, live, and age, we have witnessed how the pandemic has also sig had significant economic impacts, such as job loss and food insecurity, which notably have disproportionately impacted households of color. Social determinants have always been connected with obesity, and COVID-19's interaction with social determinants of health has in intensified certain effects on health including obesity. Next slide, please. Now, many of the pandemic's impacts, as I've noted earlier, such as job loss leading to loss of income, increased food insecurity, stress and loss of access to school meals and opportunities for physical activity, they've all exacerbated America's decades-long pattern of weight gain. There was a February 2021 poll that found that 42% of adult, US adults reported undesired weight gain since the start of the pandemic with an average weight gain of 29 pounds. And those shifting conditions, whether it's job loss and, or reduced hours, meaning reduced income to be able to buy healthy foods or childcare and school closures that reduce children's access to nutritious lunches, the job loss and financial distress that lead to ongoing mental distress and increased alcohol consumption as a coping mechanism, or heightened housing and food insecurity. These are critical social determinants of health. Next slide, please. So our report uh, cited estimates, for example, uh, that about 42 million Americans would experience food insecurity uh, in 2021. Uh, but recent data from the US Department of Agriculture showed the numbers are not likely to be that high thanks to many of the policy changes that have been passed by Congress implemented uh, by the administration during this pandemic. In the March 17th to 29th, uh, 2021 time period, it showed a decrease in food insecurity to 18% of all households. And that's the first time 
that food insecurity fell below 20% during the pandemic. And that corresponded to the passage of the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021 the prior week. Yet food insecurity overall, it, while food insecurity overall did not increase, food insecurity increased and disproportionately impacted households with children and households of color. And importantly, the American Rescue Plan Act continued and expanded many social safety net programs, including extending emergency increased SNAP benefits, continuing unemployment benefits, and providing a third economic impact payment, truly addressing again those social and structural drivers for health and well-being. Next slide, please. But what we know is that more work needs to be done. Our 2021 State of Obesity Report reviews policies and programs in key areas and offers over 30 recommendations. Some overarching themes of our recommendations is that we need to make the healthy choice the easier choice for all Americans, especially those who are in under-resourced communities. That we need to have progress that re requires funding evidence-based strategies adequately in order to bring them to scale. And that funding really has to be conducive to comprehensive long-term approaches to promote healthy eating and physical activity. And that these approaches really need to take a multi-sectoral approach. It's imperative as well that the efforts focus on the populations that are bearing a disproportionate a, a burden of obesity first. These last two points really are especially important because while obesity is a chronic disease in its own right, it's symptomatic of and responsive to broader systemic inequities. Next slide, please. So as we look at the recommendations and key federal policy recommendations of our report, the first area where we can make a significant difference is ensuring we reduce uh, the significant differences in obesity related disparities by increasing and further prioritizing health equity. For example, TIFA supports expanding funding for successful CDC programs, starting with overall funding for CDC's National Center for Chronic Disease Prevention and Health Promotion, and some of the programs that our panelist, Dr. Peterson, will be describing. But unfortunately, there is significant underfunding, meaning that not all states benefit from effective programs, such as the State Physical Activity and Nutrition Program and the Racial and Ethnic Approaches to Community Health. TIFA also supports the president's budget request of $153 million for CDC's Social Determinants of Health program, which would support multi-sector efforts to address upstream social determinants, including many that we're describing today. Secondly, we need to decrease food insecurity while also improving nutritional quality, especially in the era of COVID-19. It's important that we work with Congress to strengthen essential supports for individuals with low incomes through programs like SNAP and WIC. And school meals are one of the most consistent sources of healthy foods for millions of children at risk for food insecurity. So it is time to extend healthy school meals to all students. This would be an important step to ending child hunger and ensuring access to healthy foods. A third area of recommendations center on changing marketing and pricing strategies that lead to health disparities. Congress should close tax loopholes to end unhealthy marketing to kids. The TV advertising for unhealthy snacks and drinks actually disproportionately advertised to children of color. And we also recommend that federal, state, and local governments increase the price of sugar-sweetened beverages through an excise tax, with the tax revenue allocated to reduce health and social economic disparities and obesity prevention programs. Next slide, please. The fourth policy area that we provide recommendations in is ensuring that physical activity opportunities and the built environment are safer and more accessible for all. Congress should increase funding for active transportation uh, projects such as pedestrian and bike in biking infrastructure and safe routes to schools. And lastly, we discuss the role of the healthcare system in preventing and treating obesity. While the Affordable Care Act has granted health insurance coverage to an additional 12 million adults, millions of individuals in the United States still lack coverage, and there are significant disparities in access to care by sex, age, race, ethnicity, education, and family income. And health insurance and access to care are foundational to obesity prevention and treatment, as well as to overall health. And that's why eliminating barriers to healthcare coverage for underserved populations is critically important. And additionally, Congress should encourage the coverage of evidence-based programs in multiple ways, such as enforcing the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force recommendations for intensive behavioral counseling coverage and encouraging Medicaid programs 
to cover evidence-based pediatric weight management and programs. So with that background and overview, which is a lot of data and we wanna dive in further into understanding uh, the data, but also understanding what are some solutions to help us in addressing the crisis. Next slide, please. I am now excited to, uh, to introduce and, and for more information, yes, on our, our report, you can access our report online at uh, that website link. Uh, and you can also contact our staff, uh, Dara Lieberman, who's the Director of Government Relations. Uh, and she'll be happy to answer any questions that you have regarding our report and recommendations. Uh, but with that background, let's turn to our next slide to introduce our distinguished panelists for today's briefing. Their full bios are available in the webinar invitation as well as on the TIFO website. And we're gonna save questions uh, to the end, but just a reminder to please submit your questions in the Q&A box, not preferably not the chat, and we will get to those questions after the presentations. So our first panelist is Chef Jose Andres. Chef, chef Andres is a world-renowned chef, humanitarian and best-selling author. He is the founder of the nonprofit World Central Kitchen, which uses food as a powerful agent of positive change around the globe. Next is Dr. Ruth Peterson. Dr. Peterson is the director of the Division of Nutrition, Physical Activity and Obesity at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And this division provides national leadership on nutrition, physical activity and obesity prevention through policy and guideline development, surveillance, epidemiological and behavioral research and technical assistance to states and communities. Next is Carol Fink. Carol is the Section Chief of Chronic Disease Prevention and Health Promotion for the Alaska Division of Public Health at the Alaska Department of Health and Social Services. She has served in key roles in the state, including leading the state's physical activity and nutrition team. And our final panelist is Dr. Daryush Mozafarian, who is a cardiologist, dean, and Jean Meyer professor at the Tufts Friedman School of Nutrition Science and Policy, as well as professor of medicine at Tufts School of Medicine. Dr. Mozafarian's work aims to create a food system that is nutritious, equitable, and sustainable. So what an incredible group, an esteemed panelist that we have joining us today, literally from around the world. Uh, and we're so excited to begin our conversation with them. We're gonna first start uh, with a virtual fireside chat with Chef Andres, and then we'll move to presentations by our panelists, followed by Q&A. So if we go to the next slide, please. Now it's my honor to welcome Chef Jose Andres for our fireside chat. Welcome, Chef. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Nadine, uh, for having me with you all today. Wonderful. Well, Chef, let's let's begin. You know, today we're going to be talking a lot about food insecurity as a risk factor for obesity and other chronic health conditions. What have you seen uh, in terms of the power of food in supporting a community's health and well-being? Um, listen, uh, I wanted to start very quickly, obviously saying that you know you have there uh, Carol and Ruth and Derry, who, who are we're going to hear from them, but I'm so honored to be with you and with them three. And again, thank you for giving me the opportunity to be the one starting this because it's funny. I'm a chef, and sometimes we are the ones that they are also part of the problem in the obesity pandemic we're facing. And I want to announce that in the last year, uh, I lost uh, 35 kilos, uh, mm -hmm. more than almost 80 pounds in the last year. But I realized I'm a lucky guy. Uh, not everybody has the same opportunity as I did to be able to be uh, losing weight in the way I did it. But I weighed 100 kilos today, 220 pounds and I feel much better still slightly obese but I'm going in the right direction so with that I wanted to say that you know uh, we need to remember food is about community and food is family and if we're going to be fighting obesity uh, starting today community and family are going to be very important uh, uh, culture is defined by food but we need to make sure that that culture that we celebrate is not the same. Uh, that culture that we celebrate through food is not the same culture through food that makes us sicker and, and overweight that makes our lives in the long term uh, 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 not moving in the right way. So how we produce food, how we grow it, how we serve it 
is very much who we are. It's, it's stories behind it. You travel through America, you travel through the world. It's always food stories. People are proud. So we need to be using that as a tool, a powerful tool to combat obesity pandemic in America and around the world, especially in the rich countries as we see lately. Uh, you know, but one thing is real, that when people, when communities experience food insecurity, people cannot live their full lives. And I know it's a lot of people that guess with me when I talk, I'm sure happens to all of you. Hey, but if they are poor or food insecure or hungry, why well, it seems some of these populations in urban areas are also obese at the same time. You have a hard time understanding that one thing is about calories, another thing is about nutrients. When we are able to deliver into communities, uh, calories, 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 like, like they're cheap and quick and everybody's eating those and moves away from their traditions, from the culture that is defined by that food, by, by the family, by cooking, and cooking together when people have the time to do it. When people start use eating calories versus eating nutrients that equals culture, equals family, equals longer table, is when we see that food insecurity in the process creates obesity problems in a fascinating, crazy way. So, you know, food and nutrition insecurity, uh, we know that they are time consuming and emotionally exhausting. I've seen it, you've seen it. Uh, it is not good to be in a community that you know they are poor and hungry and you have mothers with three children waiting in line. It has to be exhausted to be them. It's difficult to speak on their behalf because they can only be the ones that know what they're going through. Um, you know, uh, hunger, uh, hunger really uh, leads people to rely on unhealthy foods and we know it, to get through the day. So that's why we need to create the stability because instability creates this obese problem, obesity problem in poor people themselves. And, and, and what happens is that uh, no matter the, the physical or the well-being cause, people will rely on those cheaper foods if they can get away with the hunger of the moment. So being poor is, is, is very costly. We need to make sure that being poor is not so costly. Is, is, is maybe cheap today in the, in the way they will eat whatever with what they can afford, but this is going to be shortening their lives as we you know and making their futures much more uh, difficult to achieve. Uh, 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 we need to remember that people buy the food that they have access to. And I know this seems uh, very obvious, but also I'm realizing that sometimes in the poor neighborhoods, can be in Haiti, can be in America, in the poor neighborhoods, sometimes food the same rice I may buy in my more luxurious, rich neighborhood is cheaper than the same rice that a mother of five can afford in her own neighborhood. How is that possible that sometimes uh, good food seems is cheaper in the richer areas than in the poorer areas? I've seen it often and we should not allow that ever to happen again. Uh, because then people will never go to the to the healthy, most nutritious foods. They will always go to the cheapest, sometimes calorie intense, non nutritional value at all. So, so when when people only have access to unhealthy uh, food, that's what we see. That's what they will buy. But when they have access to good nutrition meals, we know their life can be more fulfilling. That's what. I should be for a special nutrition, which my friend Ari has made me uh, use a, a bigger thinker about that, uh, uh, a national security issue must be the role of American government and every government in the world to make sure that not only feeding every human being on the country, but making sure that every human being on planet Earth have access not only to food, but to nutritious food. This should be very much at the helm of democracy in every single country. I used to end, no, I saw examples like in the Navajo Nation. We deliver millions of pounds of produce and dry goods uh, over the course of 2020 and beyond. So families could stay home, be safe, a lot of elderly in the Navajo Nation, and, and, and stay safe from the disease. You know, in this way, we were not throwing money at the problem. We were achieving two things. We were fighting COVID in a moment that was the most important thing to protect, especially 
everybody, but especially the elderly. But at the same time, fighting nutrition insecurity. But in the same time, by buying good, as much local food as we could, vegetables and fruits, we, we were empowering them, as what they said at the beginning, to create longer tables, to create that community and family feeling by cooking together, by cooking healthy meals together. When we provide them those healthier, more nutritious foods, they didn't have any problem. We need to make sure that people have access to them in every town across America, in every town across the world. Jeff, thank you so much. First, for actually starting out with your own story. Uh, and I commend you just uh, with regards to your own journey, uh, as, you, as you conveyed and talked about uh, your journey in healthy weight. And, and thank you for sharing the story. But we also thank you just for your service, tireless service around the world uh, in addressing these Not critical me. issues for, for community. <laughs> You know, um, World Central Kitchen has been able to bring together all kinds of stakeholders. And you, you started talking about that with regards to, especially in times of crisis, uh, to address uh, access to food and, and whether that's bringing together community volunteers to chefs, uh, to private companies and, and more. What advice would you give? Because we, we talk about this as needing to bring all sectors to the table, right? To be able to address this crisis. What, what advice would you have for us regarding building partnerships to improve access? Yeah, uh, number one, we need to understand that partnerships, they're only good when the organizations that want to partner, everyone has a very clear understanding of who they are and what they do. At World Central Kitchen, we understand who we are very clearly. We're an organization that began on the shoulders, even didn't begin only 11 years ago. I guess my experiences of 30 years is what get me, got me to help uh, organizing this, uh, making this organization, we go to emergencies and we feed the hungry and we bring water to the thirsty. And we try to do it with the urgency of yesterday, if I can paraphrase uh, Dr. Mar Martin Luther King. And by doing it quick, we make sure that people can be lifted up from the mayhem they're living and start thinking about reconstruction. Responding to the emergency of reconstruction in a very crazy way in our view, it should be happening at the same time. Because every second you wait for delivering the emergency aid is one week or one month it takes to start the reconstruction. So how we do that ourselves? We do that by buying from local farmers, local fishermen, trying to uh, put up and working the people that are okay after the catastrophe and hiring them in the restaurants or delivering the food or manning the food trucks or helping us uh, cook traditional dishes from the area, uh, trying to always come to the taste of, of the people. So that's who we are. That's what we do. So how, how those partnerships uh, uh, can be done and can multiply? I always say that in our case, it's not like we look for them, just happen as we go. Uh, let me give you an example of strange partnerships, not necessarily that have to do with obesity, but has to do with health. In Bahamas, we were the first ones, almost seven, eight days before any of the other big NGOs came to ground zero. We reached close to 70,000 meals a day. We only did this because we were bold enough to understand the only way to feed 14 islands after a hurricane five category decimated uh, so many of those islands was through helicopters. Boat was not an option. And at the beginning, if we wanted to deliver food, that was the only way. By delivering those meals and fresh fruit and water filtration systems, and we were bringing the helicopters um, um, empty. When the hospital in Abaco had people that they need to be moved to another better hospital in the capital, all of a sudden we became a natural partner, them of us and us of them. It's not like we were helping. They knew what they needed. We never did medical evacuations. We are a food organization. Did make sense in that moment with boots on the ground that the, the helicopters bringing food will take people almost like it was much the movie back to the capital to take care of these people. We did more than 50 medical evacuations in that thing. That example, I'm not really giving it to you to kind of, I'm very proud as a cook. My mom was a nurse and my father. So yes, I'm very proud of, of saying, hey, I cannot believe we're doing this at such a scale. But the message I want to send is use not 
bragging rights, we did that. But these boots on the ground. Partnerships cannot be achieved in an office. Partnerships and the real things need to be achieved on the ground. And the right partnerships will only be achieved. I'm tired of conferences where we are talking about hunger and we are never bringing hungry people. We are doing a conference about empowering women in rural areas. And we never had often those women with real voice, giving them the main moment to tell us really what we want, we should be listening, not what we want to hear. And that's why for me, boots on the ground is the most important part of partnerships, my best partnerships. And I'm speaking now as Jose Andres, the person, not even so much as uh, Jose Andres, Wall Central Kitchen, are those partnerships that boots on the ground allow me to see what all the people were doing. In the sequence of food, what we do beyond the emergency, and that's something I'm very proud, like we saw in Puerto Rico. Uh, like we saw uh, in Puerto Rico, we invested partner with almost 200 farmers. All the farmers are fresh vegetables, fruits, milks, all local. I believe that, yes, we have to have a global view to feed the world because we need think global. We are going to be 9 billion. But I believe the best interest will be when the global is taken care of, but then the local is taken care of too. Is the only way we are going to be providing better, nutritious, healthier meals to many families across America and across the world. So this is very much uh, what I would say. And the most important is adapting. I don't like to partner with organizations they are the same way I'm telling you that everybody needs to know who they are and what they do. Still, I need flexibility. What we saw in 2021, in 2020, that everybody was following a plan. What happened in 2020? That nothing went as planned. We need to start putting a little bit the plans on the side and start raising awareness of adaptation. We need to be embracing the complexities of the moment. And by telling everybody that every problem is an opportunity for you to solve, by being animals of adaptation, we will solve the problems in real time. If we have food deserts in America still today, and those women receiving, and I mentioned women with the most due respect, because we know who fits America and who fits the world are no men like me, are really women. I say this with the most most bigger respect. I'm always cooking next to women everywhere I go because they are the ones feeding everybody. Uh, when those women in their neighborhoods, they don't even have a market to spend snaps. Even if the government wants to help them, they need to go somewhere else. They need to go to a richer neighborhood. You see, when sometimes big, big problems have simple solutions and the reaction should be the urgency of now yesterday, Boots on the ground, seeing what happens, and then have a quick reaction to the situation. This is why I'm looking in partnerships. If not partnerships, you spend time. You know, I say always that partnerships, one thing is me the day I met my wife. Yes, I took the time because she was a hard lady. She didn't care about me. And it took me time to, to convince her I was the right man. This is in a relationship. This may take a week, a month, or a year or more. But when we're talking about organizations, organizations are created and must be there to resolve the problems of the people in real time. Why? Because hunger, health, being thirsty cannot wait. Every day we wait, every week we, we wait. Every child is not being fed right. Every woman and man that get obese in the process of trying to survive, we are used cutting short their lives and their potential of contributing to America better. That's why we have no time to wait. And for me, partnerships must be very clear understanding who everybody is, but very understanding of being boots on the ground, not in the office, and more important, if we know the problem is there, what are we still talking about it? Just go and start fixing it. Chef, thank you. Thank you tremendously for, for these insights, uh, these important points you've raised specifically about Partnerships, partnerships cannot be achieved in an office, uh, really, but in uh, on the ground and, and with the community and working with those who are on the front lines of this every day, who know the solutions and answers, and that it's providing the resources, uh, being expedient in doing so, and being committed uh, to doing so as well. And thank you for 
you bringing your, your lens of service and experience around the world to the policy arena as well. Um, you are serving as co-chair of the Bipartisan Policy Center Task Force on Food and Nutrition Security and advancing many of these similar policies as it relates to SNAP and WIC and a whole host of areas to address food insecurity. So we thank you uh, because we know how busy you are um, and, and, and you are in, in the response mode currently. And just thank you for the time and continue to look forward to working with you to advance these critical policies so that everyone has a fair and just opportunity to be as healthy as possible. Thank you for having me. And you mentioned very quickly the, the task force, which I'm, I'm, I'm honored to be, be serving. I know I'm I'm like the outsider. I'm not the guy with the titles. I, I left school when I was 15, but uh, but uh, I know what I know by being there and learning from people like you. When I say, obviously, that we are not going to change the world in an office, at the same time, I understand that we need data and studies and good and good people that really make brings awareness to Congress and to the people in general. But that the task force is the thing I'm very proud of. That doesn't mean we will achieve it is that we need to be fighting. If it's one thing I want to be achieving is we want free school meals for every children in America, period. Equally, free uh, food deserts, they need to be something of the past, no more. And we are trying to work with things that they are pragmatic that many of you I know you, uh, you support. And we need to make sure that we stop throwing money at the problem, which is fixing Americans when they get older and obese and unhealthy and start investing in the beginning when they have all the potential to be whatever they want to be in this beautiful country of ours uh, by being healthy, by eating good foods that gives them that opportunity to be everything uh, they want to be. So that's what we're doing at the task force. And, and, and I know all of us, we are, we are joining forces and we have the same heart and the same ideas in many ways. So let's hope we, we are successful in the one or two years. America, America needs us to be successful. So let's try to make it happen. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Chef. And it's, a, it's an honor for, T for Trust for America's Health to serve on that task force with you. And, and Dr. Mosafarian is also a member of the task force. So we look forward to that important work as it continues uh, to move forward. And thank you. Uh, be well and, and be safe. Thank you. Uh, for our audience, Chef, Chef Andres is, uh, will not be able to stay with us for the remainder of the, of the um, session, the briefing, but we do thank him for his participation and, and as we noted, for his service and, and really these important lessons learned and advice that he has uh, with regards to strengthening our nation's food uh, and nutrition security. Uh, now I'm pleased to begin our panel presentations. And again, for our audience, please submit any questions. We're seeing questions coming in into the Q&A. Uh, we are going to start off with uh, Dr. Ruth Peterson from the Division of Nutrition, Physical Activity, and Obesity at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Dr. Peterson, welcome, and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. If we can go to the next slide, to represent CDC and to share with you the efforts that CDC is taking to address obesity and advance health equity. Next slide, please. You've seen the map and there've already been some questions in the chat box, but I just wanna make sure to reiterate that CDC is proud to release this data once a year and saddened by what the data shows every year. So we continue to see adult obesity prevalence rising across the United States, as has been stated. I wanna note this is from self-reported data from the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance Survey of 2020. So we can talk more about that with questions and answers. Next slide. You see the darker colors are the most, are the highest rates of obesity um, that's reported. This year, when we break the maps apart into racial and ethnic um, distinctions, you can see the depressing trends that continue where the darker the color, the higher the prevalence. And in fact, this year for our non-Hispanic black adults, we had to add a darker color for the over 40% reporting adult obesity in these areas. But you also see the problem in the Latino and Hispanic adults. You see the, the overall picture continues with white adults. And there was a question in the chat box about what the overall prevalence is in, in, in this data overall for the country. And it's around 20% when you look overall. And then of note this year, we were able to combine multiple years of data to get the first real picture on the state level for our Asian adults in the country. So this data is very important for us to start to have in these conversations. So next slide. 
It's also been noted the depressing sort of intersection of the increase in childhood obesity as, and how that relates to the COVID pandemic. So we've seen from studies within our division that have been um, published, as you see here at the bottom of the slide, that among children and adolescents with COVID-19, underlying medical conditions, including obesity, increase the likelihood for hospitalization and severe COVID-19 illness. So while this is already depressing, we have also new data that was just released from our division showing that among children and adolescents, the average rate of body mass index increase. So the BMI increase approximately doubled during the pandemic for children and adolescents. So you can see at the bottom of the slide, the continuum there that given those two factors, we've set ourselves for decades of worse health outcomes. Next slide. So trying to turn this to a more positive tone, what is the vision of the Division of Nutrition, Physical Activity, Obesity for addressing this issue. So our vision around nutrition is having optimal nutrition across the lifespan. And the lifespan is really an important concept. And the chef just mentioned this as far as starting early, and we indeed try to do that. So we work at multiple levels to establish healthier food environments for all, including even in prenatal care, maternal nutrition, breastfeeding. We look at early child nutrition that's supported now by the new dietary guidelines for Americans on the very important attributes of the zero, the birth to 24 months for nutrition. We look at some settings, including early care and education. We look at farm to education. We have healthy weight programs we're developing that I can speak to. We have, as far as the entire population, food service guideline implementation, healthy food system development, and then we look at food and nutrition security. And please note the foundation there of achieving health equity. So again, I can speak more about this. Next slide. I wanna take a breath here and show you our definition for food and nutrition security, because it's become very important to us to be consistent and aligned with other organizations such as WHO. So food and nutrition security exists when all people at all times have physical, social, and economic access to food, which is safe and consumed in sufficient quantity and quality to meet their dietary needs and their food preferences and is supported by an environment of adequate sanitation, health services and care, allowing for a healthy and active life. A very long definition. You wonder why there are so many words to that. There are so many words because every single one of them is important in our work and especially in addressing our vision of health equity. Next slide. So the COVID pandemic has increased food and nutrition insecurity as, be, as been noted. And you can see already in 2019 prior to the pandemic, one in four Native American individuals one in five black individuals, one in six Latino individuals, and one in 12 lived in food insecure households. So the pandemic has only increased these rates. And the paradox is that food and nutrition insecurity is indeed a risk factor for obesity. Next slide. So again, I said that health equity is foundational to our work in the division. And health equity is when everyone has the opportunity to be as healthy as possible. So we work in partnership with state, local, tribal, territorial health agencies, public health agencies, organizations. And we look at how you remove those environmental and those systemic barriers to health and advance health equity. Next slide. And we do this through our funded program recipients. What you see here is a map is where, is where our division, DNPAO, has funding that goes out to a, a, different, a different cadre of people depending on what the funding is. So first is our State Physical Activity and Nutrition Program, or SPAN. So this goes to state health departments, and you see the 16 states that receive this funding, funding in the teal color on this map. Those state health departments subcontract with local recipients so that they can work together on addressing the needs of those populations who are disproportionately affected by chronic disease, including obesity. And they look at strengthening efforts to implement interventions in those settings that will be the hardest settings and the hardest to reach populations to support healthy nutrition, safe and accessible physical activity, and breastfeeding. We're also fortunate to have the High Obesity Program 
as a congressional funding line. And this funding goes to 15 land grant universities who leverage their community extension services to increase access to healthier foods and opportunities for physical activity in counties that have more than 40% of adults with obesity. And this data actually is from the BRFSS data that makes them eligible for this funding. The racial and ethnic approaches to community health, the REACH program, we're pleased to have that in our division as well. This program has been at CDC for over 21 years. And currently we're able to fund 20, 40 organizations to improve health, prevent chronic disease, reduce health disparities among those racial and ethnic populations with the highest risk or burden of chronic diseases. And you're gonna hear from one of our programs, Carol is gonna speak about the Alaska program in the panel as well. Next slide, please. So what do we ask our recipients to work on? What is the evidence-based strategy? How are we making, how, do we, how are we gonna make a difference? So the nutrition strategies across our grant programs span hop and reach include the things you see on the slide here. We implement interventions to support breastfeeding. We implement nutrition standards in key institutions such as early care and education centers. We accelerate, adopt, or expand farm to ECE programs. We implement the food service guidelines in work sites and community settings to increase the availability of healthy foods. And these are tied also to the Dietary Guidelines for Americans. We work with food vendors, distributors, and producers to enhance healthier food procurement and sales. And we also look at market pull of healthier foods. Next slide. We also have an incredible initiative, Active People Healthy Nation, that we lead to help move 27 million more Americans to be more physically active by 2027. So this obviously increases physical activity, which will improve quality of life, reduce healthcare costs, and it will work on obesity um, prevention and also weight maintenance. So this program is also something we implement through our recipients and other partners, and you can find more on our website. Next slide. So one thing I want to actually share with you as well is we are working to develop sustainable healthy weight programs for children. So what's interesting about this is the USPSTF guidelines came out that recommended that there be focused counseling of 26 hours with children at an early age to help them create and maintain a healthy weight. So we have this program, we are developing it, it benefits, it focuses on children six to 13 years of age. So we're intervening early. It uses education and counseling to help families establish healthy eating patterns. We have seen BMI reduction for participating children as well as their parents. It can be reimbursed through Medicaid. It can be implemented in multiple settings, including our federally qualified health centers. And our future work is to increase reimbursement, use innovative tools to measure and evaluate success and spread and scale this across the country. Next slide, please. Thank you so much. And I'll turn it over to the next panel member. Thank you very much, Dr. Peterson, just for that really informative discussion uh, and presentation. Uh, next, we're going to hear from Carol Fink uh, from the state, Ala state of Alaska Section of Chronic Disease Prevention and Health Promotion. Carol, I'll turn it over to you. Good morning from Alaska, the largest state in the union. Next slide, please. Thank you for inviting me to speak with you today. Alaska is an amazing place and I love living here. Next slide. Alaskans who live in our northernmost communities don't see the sun for 64 days in the winter, but bask in the midnight summer uh, sun all summer. Next slide. And Alaskans who live in our southeast, they live in a rainforest. Next slide. About 200 villages can only be reached by airplane or boat, which makes transportation of people and goods difficult and costly. Next slide. While Alaska Native people live in every Alaskan town, Alaska Native people represent most of the folks in these remote locations. Next slide. Services in these villages are often limited and expensive. Some villages lack full service grocery stores, running water, flush toilets, and doctors who live there. Next slide. These streams can contribute to our food nutrition security issues and make physical active physical activity challenging. Next slide. 
When I started in the obesity prevention back in the mid 2000s, it was really an emerging field of public health practice. The number of children and adults living with obesity was continuing to increase year after year and the diseases of obesity were being diagnosed earlier in life than ever before. The media and the public's interest peaked and stories about the shocking trend lines became common headlines. Next slide. But while the media was talking, CDC got to work addressing the issue. They assigned their experts to provide leadership around obesity prevention at the national level. They developed a national strategy. CDC experts uh, conducted or commissioned research to find solutions. They helped build obesity prevention experts at the state health department. I learned from CDC the promising practices and was introduced to the scientific methods on how to measure our success. And CDC funded state health departments to get to work. Alaska's health department was one of the recipients of the support and I was there to receive it and help draft our state plan, Alaska in Action. We have a comprehensive program addressing obesity. I'm just gonna focus these next eight minutes on a couple projects addressing childcare, food, nutrition security, physical activity, friendly routes and sugary drinks. Next slide. At the CDC trainings, I learned tips and tricks from other states on how to engage with schools, childcare centers, employers, and healthcare providers. At that point in the obesity epidemic, we really didn't know how to change the course of the trend, but we began with promising practices. The support from CDC helped us in some very Alaska-specific, unique food and nutrition programs. Next slide. In Alaska, we focused on our youngest kiddos. When we began working with child care center staff, we identified a desire to serve Alaska Native traditional foods. So we provided the leadership to bring together the agencies that needed to engage in the process and approve the serving of foods such as reindeer, whale, and fiddlehead ferns. Through our leadership, these agencies developed trainings and created resources. Today, numerous child care centers serve their kiddos Alaska Native traditional foods and this is connecting our kids with their cultural heritage and increasing their food security. Next slide. Bristol Bay hosts the largest commercial wild fishery, salmon fishery in the world. Each year, millions of salmon are harvested by fishermen to feed the world. However, on the shores of Bristol Bay, locally caught fish had no place in the school cafeterias. The staff at these schools decided to change that. These staff worked with local fishermen and the local fish processor to set up a donation program. When fishermen dropped off their fish at the processor, they donated a certain number of pounds to the school. Then at no charge, the processor packaged the fish into individual portions and sto stored that frozen fish. When our staff discovered this innovative solution, we helped share the success story with other school districts across the state. Next thing we knew, some Alaska students were eating locally caught salmon once a week in their school lunch program. Next slide. In Alaska, we focused on schools and students. We provided school district staff the knowledge and the tools to improve food and beverage choices. Schools cut the amount of junk food in vending machines in half from 2002 to 2008. And by 2011, Alaska was seed success. Next slide. CDC published our data in their Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report. This report showed our overall obesity trend line had decreased for Anchorage area students. We made national news and Robert Wood Johnson Foundation came to Anchorage to capture what we had done. While I was super proud of our efforts, I was a little uneasy because there was an underlying story that we didn't know how to address. The number of Alaska Native and Pacific Islander students living with obesity was increasing. However, the decline in obesity among white students was making the overall trend line appear to decline. Our data set didn't have the variables we needed. Race is just this proxy for the social determinants of health, such as systematic racism, household income, parental educational attainment, housing, and the student zip code. Without these variables, we didn't know how to address this disparity. So, <laughs> We know so much more now about addressing disparities and the social determinants of health, but then we just kept working on what we knew how to do in physical activity and nutrition. Next slide. So we use CDC communities putting prevention to work cooperative agreement funding to address food and nutrition security issues in Alaska. 
With these resources, our health department staff facilitated the conversations to identify the issues. We commissioned reports, we established facts, and we supported a coalition. Over time, this group of stakeholders became self-sufficient and the 501c3 Alaska Food Policy Council is making Alaska's food system healthier, more self-reliant, and more prosperous. Next slide. CDC support helped establish relationships in Alaska that still exist today. For example, CDC recognized walkability expert visited Anchorage to teach us how connecting everyday destinations with physically active friendly routes could improve the public's health. During this visit, we brought together public health practitioners, the city's traffic engineers, planners, and public facility staff for the very first time ever. While many, many successes have followed this visit, the local transportation agency in Anchorage, which is Alaska's most populated city, formed a bicycle and pedestrian advisory committee that requires membership from a public health organization. And I served as a founding and current member of that committee. Anchorage is now better integrating health into transportation planning. Next slide. CDC provided us with a framework on how to approach the obesity epidemic. They gave us six targets, one of which was to decrease sugary drink intake. We used this target to focus our work. We tapped into an already established public health information system to collect sugary drink intake of toddlers. The system would provide us with trends and consumption patterns, and it would allow us to tease out the impacts of the social determinants of health. Next slide. By 2013, we were surveying and talking with families of young children. We were learning their knowledge, attitudes, and behaviors related to sugary drinks. By 2016, we were well prepared to break funding from two CDC divisions, the Division of Oral Health and the Division of Physical Activity, Nutrition, and Obesity. We launched our Healthy Drinks for Healthy Kids project with tribal dental partners. These partners served Alaska Native people in remote locations and our project was tailored to serve those who would benefit the most. We developed and trained tribal dental providers to use our guide to talk with families about the large amounts of sugar hiding in drinks, the health risks linked to that added sugar and steps family can take to cut back on sugary drink. We also developed new patient and public education materials and created a short video public service announcements. Our educational guide for dentists was so innovative, it was adopted and adapted by the Office of Oral Health in California. All California public health regions are using these educational materials to help families cut back on sugary drinks. Next slide. While our success attracted, our success also attracted attention from global public health organizations. The Heart Foundation of Jamaica and the Heart and Stroke Foundation of Barbados adapted our public service announcement videos for its campaign. Throughout the years, we have continued to expand our sugary drink prevention efforts. Next slide. And of course, we always evaluate our work. So I'll wrap up by telling you how families of young children are seen and responding positively to our public education messages. We knew from our research that three year, Alaska three-year-olds are more likely to have a sugary drink if they lived with mothers who were younger, had lower incomes, had lower education, or if they lived in a rural zip code. Next slide. After our campaign was broadcast, results from our survey showed that 38% of Alaska mothers had recently seen our sugary drink campaign messages. Among mothers who learned something new from our campaign, almost half said they changed what drinks they served their children. These moms were more likely to be younger, have less education, be Alaska Native, and live in rural zip codes. By reaching the families who will benefit the most, we are helping reduce the disparities. Next slide. While the obesity epidemic no longer has the media's focus, it is still just as important. Nationally, more people than ever are living with obesity, resulting in poor health and poor quality of life. The COVID-19 pandemic has reduced food security, negatively impacted the amount of physical activity Americans get and demonstrated how a healthy body weight and regular physical activity can protect one from serious COVID-19 illness and chronic disease. Next slide. CDC's leadership, expertise, and financial support throughout the years has provided my team the stability, the sustainability that is needed to make a difference. 
However, the true credit goes to my dedicated colleagues. They're the heart and soul of this work. We have stuck together for over a decade and between us have over 70 years of combined public health expertise. This stability has helped as it's enabled us to build on our previous accomplishments, prove to our partners that we are committed to be innovative, be daring, and to continue advancing towards our long-term goal of making Alaska a healthier place to live. We've dropped a PDF in the chat with the links to the programs I mentioned. So please take a look at that and thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Carol. Um, just a terrific overview of, of truly how you work to um, identify the community needs, tailor the programs, do it in partnership, have it be sustained, um, really critical messages that you are sharing. And, and, and as you noted, that we actually can address and reduce disparities. Thank you so much for that important work uh, that you've been engaged in for so many years uh, in the state of Alaska. Uh, next, we're going to hear from our, our final panelist, which is Dr. Mozafarian uh, from the Tufts Friedman School of Nutrition, Science and Policy. And as a reminder, we're continuing to see the questions coming in. Please do continue to put questions into the Q&A feature and we will start to begin our question and answer period after Dr. Mozafarian's presentation. Dr. Mozafarian, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Gracia and Trust for America's Health uh, for you know, convening everyone on this incredibly important topic. Um, I'm gonna anchor the, the conversations and, and I think highlight you know, my, my sort of view about some of the causes and solutions to the uh, obesity epidemic. Next slide. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, I'm going to uh, talk about nutrition because I think, as has been highlighted, the obesity epidemic has really occurred over just 30 years. We, re we didn't have an obesity epidemic in 1990. And if you look at what has changed in 30 years, there's not really great evidence that physical activity has changed very much. Our genes haven't changed very much. Our built environment hasn't changed very much. Um, you know, all of those things are good solutions to the obesity epidemic, but they're not the cause because they haven't actually changed, but our food has dramatically changed. And so I really believe that the, by far the main driving force of the obesity epidemic it, or is changes to our food system. Next slide. And good quantitative data show that food is the number one cause of poor health in the United States. This is an analysis just published a few years ago, looking at preventable causes of death in the United States. Uh, and at the top is poor diet, exceeding tobacco, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, alcohol and drug use, air pollution, almost any other uh, risk factor you can think of. Next slide. And this is causing enormous disease. As has been mentioned now today, three in four American adults are overweight, uh, have overweight or obesity. One in two have diabetes or prediabetes. And only one in 10 American adults are actually metabolically healthy. If you just look at basic parameters of metabolic health, nine out of 10 American adults are metabolically unhealthy. So just we have a population that's overwhelmingly unhealthy. Being healthy is, is the exception. Even among teenagers, among teenagers, one in four teenagers today have prediabetes, one in four have overweight or obesity, and one in six have fatty liver disease. Just shocking statistics for the future of our nation. Uh, next slide. And the economic costs of this are crushing. Uh, in just 50 years, healthcare costs have skyrocketed from seven to 18% of GDP from just one in $20 in the federal budget to one in $3 in the, in, in the federal budget and about one in $3 in the average state budget from 80 billion to 1.2 trillion in healthcare spending for US businesses. And 80% of our healthcare spending is on preventable chronic diseases and obesity is one of the biggest preventable chronic diseases. And at the beginning, um, uh, I think uh, Tim, Tim Hughes or Dr. Gracia mentioned you know, that they were supportive of the Biden administration's $153 million for addressing social determinants of health. And Dr. Peterson's budget at the CDC is also about $100 million. But, so think about those numbers, $100 million for the CDC's efforts here, $153 million uh, for social determinants of health, when the government spends $160 billion, billion on direct medical costs for diabetes alone. We are absolutely focusing on treating the sick rather than, than preventing disease and making people healthy. Next slide. And this analysis from the Rockefeller Foundation puts an exclamation point on it from earlier this summer. Um, this found, if you look at the true cost of food, our, our nation spends about $1.1 trillion on all of the direct costs of purchasing, supplying food. And for, in addition to that $1.1 trillion of direct costs, our economy is losing another $2.1 trillion Due, about half of that due to lost uh, human health. 
in, in terms of healthcare spending and lost productivity, and about half of that due to challenges to the environment and biodiversity and poverty and lost livelihoods. And so think about that. For every dollar we spend in our economy on food, our economy loses another $2. This is not a winning proposition. And I think this economic argument is what's going to get policymakers' attention to, to make a real difference. Next slide. Now, if we want to make a difference, I, it's, there's no simple solution. I agree with many of the solutions that were proposed uh, in Trust for America's Health. Um, but we really need a comprehensive strategy. And this is kind of what's most striking. With the 18th report from Trust for America's Health, just that should be news. We've had 18 years of reports on obesity. With all the efforts that are going on, obesity is still going up. We don't have a national plan to address this. And we need a national plan. I think that clear actions across six categories Best Buy policies can really rapidly turn the corner on our poor nutrition and our poor health. We need to advance research and science. We need to advance nutrition and healthcare. We need to uh, leverage our federal nutrition programs. We need to advance business innovation. We must advance public health and education. And we need to coordinate all this. There actually has to be a plan. Uh, next slide. And so in healthcare, you know, we think of this as food as medicine, and there's a range of interventions. Uh, but I think that the four top priority interventions in healthcare are medically tailored meals for the sickest patients, produce prescriptions where doctors can write a prescription and, and patients with specific conditions can actually get food, healthy food paid for by their insurance, uh, leveraging uh, registered dietitians by actually reimbursing them for counseling. The vast majority of diet related conditions right now are not reimbursed for dietitians. And lastly, in ensuring uh, medical education on nutrition for doctors and other healthcare providers. Next slide. Now, medically tailored meals are just a no-brainer. This is giving the sickest patients a food who, who may have severe diseases, and this actually saves money. Even accounting for the cost of the program uh, in one analysis saves $9,000 per year per patient. The state of Massachusetts, the state of California, Kaiser Permanente, other healthcare organizations are testing this. It's time for CMMI, uh, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, to test medically tailored meals. Next slide. Produce prescriptions are also incredibly promising. This is a meta-analysis of 13 produce prescription interventions. These work. They increase fruit and vegetable intake. They lower BMI. And among patients with diabetes, they lower A1C. We're about to launch a large randomized controlled trial with Kaiser Permanente in Southern California on produce prescriptions. CMMI also, the federal government also must take this up and really invest and test this and scale this. Next slide. And we have to leverage SNAP. Um, uh, uh, next slide. I, I don't know. There shouldn't. I don't think there are animations. Thank you. Um, we have proposed SNAP Plus rather than trying to argue about what should or shouldn't be included or what should or shouldn't be restricted, which I think has a lot of moral and ethical dilemmas. We've argued that we should just have incentives and disincentives. We should add incentives, 30% incentives for a whole bunch of foods, not just fruits and vegetables, but also whole grains, nuts and seeds, seafood, and healthy oils. And then disincentivize, but don't restrict foods that we know are harming health, like soda, junk food, and processed meats. If this was done nationally, we've, we've uh, estimated through our research that this would prevent about a million cardiovascular events among people currently on SNAP, and it would actually save money. It would save money immediately, $10 billion at five years, $63 billion at lifetime. It's time for the state of Alaska, who's here, and other states to, to put waivers into USDA to test SNAP Plus and other similar incentives. Next slide. And we have to advance nutrition science. One of the most shocking things I'm gonna tell you is that we don't totally understand what's causing the obesity epidemic. National data from NHANES, which is our best national data, show that calorie intake, reported calorie intake in the United States has gone down every year the last 15 years. Calorie intake is going down. Physical activity is not changing. So this idea that we're overeating into obesity is not supported by the data. What do I think is causing obesity? I think it's the uh, ultra processing of foods, which starves our microbiomes and reduces our metabolic expenditure. I think it's intergenerational effects, like effects from mom to, to baby through microRNA and changes to the placenta. It could be things like antibiotics that are actually changing our, our microbiomes as well. But this idea that it's just marketing and overeating is not supported by the data. We're eating less every year and still gaining weight. So that we really have some crucial, crucial science to advance. And I think we have to really put our money into this. We are spending so much money. Our economy is losing hundreds of billions of dollars for nutrition. We have to invest in the science to figure this out quickly. And that's why we've proposed that the NIH have a National Institute of Nutrition created by Congress. Uh, next slide. 
And then we have to we have to coordinate all of this. You know, as I mentioned, there is shockingly no plan. There is no plan. And a U.S. Government Accountability Office report that just came out uh, this fall again put an exclamation point on this. They concluded that chronic diet-related health conditions are costly, deadly, and preventable. All their words. They concluded that there are 200 different federal efforts spread across 21 agencies that aim to improve nutrition, but they're fragmented. They're not harmonized. They're not working together. And the GAO directly concluded that we need a strategy and that Congress should, should implement the strategy by identifying and directing a federal entity to lead this. This has been missing for the last 50 years, and we need to actually have a coordinating office and a strategy in the government to fix nutrition. Next slide. And one possibility that we've recommended and written about and happy to discuss in the, in the q and if there's interest, is an office of the National Director of Food and Nutrition in the White House. There is no such office today, but we learned after September 11th when we saw that our uh, national intelligence was fragmented and we need coordination that we should create such an office. And we created the office of the Director of National Intelligence, which has been very, very successful for coordinating our national intelligence. We need this for food. We need an office of the National Director of Food and Nutrition. Next slide. And so I just want to conclude that we can actually fix this. We can deal with this dire uh, uh, and growing disease of obesity. We can fix food and nutrition, improve gut health, reduce cardiovascular disease, improve cancers, help our economy, improve health equity, increase sustainability and, and uh, a regional resilience of food systems, improve national security, but we need a plan. And, and the plan that, you know, that, that I would outline is across these levers. We need to leverage our federal nutrition programs, particularly school meals, SNAP uh, and WIC. We need to leverage food as medicine in, in healthcare. We need to advance science and innovation at the NIH, as I mentioned, but also ensure that USDA research really focuses on the nexus of production, health, and sustainability. All three should be at the crux of USDA research. We must catalyze private, private innovation and jobs. There's lots of companies who are thinking about and trying to innovate here. And right now we're just relying on the free market to, to, for them to be successful. The government has a role to play just the same way the government has advanced green energy or has advanced the railroad system in the last century or advanced many other industries, it's time to advance the food industry who are doing the right thing. And that should include BIPOC food entrepreneurs uh, who, who can provide economic empowerment and nourish their communities. We need to leverage public health and education, the FDA through salt, sugar, and crunchy pack labels, the CDC through the Division of Nutrition, Physical Activity and Obesity and Surveillance, the USDA and the FTC. And we need to coordinate all of this. And so thank you for letting me participate and look forward to discussion. Thank you so much, Dr. Mozafarian, in particular for presenting, you know, this, re, as you noted, a reimagined food system and, and providing um, policy solutions and recommendations as we consider how to move forward. And I'm sure we'll be getting more into those details uh, in our Q&A. Um, so that concludes our, our panel presentations, and we're now going to open it up uh, for uh, some questions uh, from our audience. I'm going to turn it over now and, and, and happy to be joined by my colleague, Dara Lieberman, uh, the Director of Government Relations at TIFA, who is going to help moderate our Q&A. Dara, let me turn it over to you. Great. Thank you so much. And thank you to all of our panelists. Um, I wanted to start with Dr. Peterson because we got a version of the same question about three or four different ways. And I think people were pretty um, struck by the map you showed, which showed only 16 st states funded through the state physical activity and nutrition grants. Um, not all states receive a REACH uh, grant. Can you explain a little bit about um, how CDC selects the states that do receive a state physical activity and nutrition grant, why not all states are funded, and, and if you've seen any difference between the funded and unfunded states? Yes, thanks so much for that question. Um, so CDC, put, we put our funding out in a competitive nature. So we don't sit in the office and decide what happens. We ask people to apply for the grant. And then we have ranked, we have objective review panels for all of our funding streams. And then it's ranked on who has the highest rank. And we fund until we run out of resources. So let me just tell you that every state in DC applied for the SPAN funding. So everybody had an application that met the criteria to be funded. So we call that approved, but unfunded. So we have a list from those recipients now from four years ago, we would have funded all states if we had had enough resources to do that. And let me put two caveats in here. If we, if we really want states to be effective 
through evidence-based strategy interventions and working with partnerships and and sending money through sub subcontracts to those local areas and local public health, they have to have enough money to do that successfully. So that we we put out nine approximately nine hundred thousand dollars to every state every year for their funding because we know that's what it takes to hire staff, give subcontracts, do the real work, develop the partnerships. So that that is our issue with SPAN. Every state could have been funded and we were able to fund 16. With REACH, we fund 40 now, and that's actually an increase over the last few years because Congress has put more money into the REACH category for funding. But we had 260 plus applications. So the demand for this work at the ground level, this is really where the boots on the ground are. We're not able to have enough resources to put into meeting the, the demand given the supply of resources. Um, and then as far as the question, I think, Dar, about outcomes, can we show different outcomes between those funded and unfunded? I would actually take the question to a different level. Look at where the funding needs to go and look at where those maps are, are these dark, dark red, red, dark red colors. And we need really strong applications to come from those state public health and community-based organizations. And that's hard for people to do when they haven't had an investment in public health over the last 10, 20 years, they don't have people who are experts in nutrition or in physical activity or in how you do evaluation. So, so we're actually um, really trying to figure out how to build capacity in those states as well so they can be more competitive. Yeah, Over. excellent. And I, I will put in a plug that TIFA in our report recommend $125 million for the Division of Nutrition, Physical Activity and Obesity. We really believe these uh, need to be 50 state programs. Um, we, and of course, we support the, the overall chronic center funding as well. Um, a question for, um, for Carol, Ms. Fink. You put uh, so many great programs in place in Alaska, but you still saw a disparity in obesity prevalence for Alaska Native and Pacific, or I Pacific Islander students. Why do you think that was? Well, I'm going to use some really public health terms. Um, it has to do with reach and dose, and then also the amount of time it takes to change body weight. So we had these amazing programs, but we were not able to reach every kid in the state with our resources. You know, we've got 400 elementary schools and not everybody was offering fish to school. Um, so that has to do with reach. And then while our programming was really innovative, the dose or the amount of the intervention that each of the students received was kind of insufficient, right? For example, kids were only getting salmon once a week in their school lunch program. So anyone who's tried dieting, you know, it takes a lot of work to change body weight and eating healthy for a day or even a week doesn't result in much change. So we wouldn't have it really expected from these programs if you're eating fish only once a week to see a change. Doesn't mean our programs were ineffective, but it shows that only some kids were benefiting in the places where we had sufficient, like our geographic areas where we had sufficient reach and dose, but we didn't have it statewide or in the Anchorage uh, metropolitan area. Thank you. Um, and Dr. Mozafarian, you touched a little bit on um, some of the priority domains that you think need, we need to advance for the food system. Can you talk about how you think the federal government could incentivize the private sector to do more uh, to make healthy foods more accessible? And I also received a question asking if you could clarify what you meant by um, disincentivizing unhealthy foods in SNAP and incentivizing healthy foods. Yeah, so I think in SNAP, um, you know, it would be a, a transparent program that participants could decide and choose to, to enroll in, where if they bought foods that are incentivized, they would get $1.30 on their dollar of benefits. And if they bought the disincentivized foods, they would get 70 cents on the dollar. So they would get less, less benefits for, for buying those foods. And those disincentives pay for the incentives, so it doesn't raise the cost of the overall program. And I think in a divided Congress, that would be challenging to just do incentives because incentives are quite expensive. So it's an incentive disincentive program. And through that balance of buying less of those unhealthy foods and more of the healthy foods, people could you know, keep their overall SNAP benefits the same, but shift their, their market basket. Um, uh, in, in terms of, um, uh, shoot, remind me, uh, remind me of your first question again, Dara. 
the um, how to incentivize the private sector to take action? Oh, yeah. I think this is crucial. I mean, the private sector is, is massive and there's lots of disruption going on right now. Lots of companies aiming to make more healthier foods, but they tend to cost a premium. They tend not to be accessible to everybody. And always the, the, the science isn't always excellent. So I think there's many things. So first, I think there can be you know, direct tax policies so that companies that are meeting definitions of addressing equity or sustainability or nutrition you know, can get tax breaks and tax benefits. Um, second, there could be uh, a low cost loans or even grants as has been done with green energy, right? Gre again, green energy is a great model for that. The government's done lots of things to promote green energy. Um, third, the, the government or, or non-government uh, organizations could, could identify and promote clear uh, investing metrics for companies that are pursuing nutrition. Right now, uh, so-called ESG metrics, uh, environment social governance metrics, are really um, becoming mandatory for, for major investors to invest in companies around sustainability, around carbon. And so big, big investors, pension, you know, uh, venture capital funds, pension funds, institutional investors are demanding that companies show they're gonna meet environmental goals to get to have uh, companies, uh, you know, uh, sorry, investors buy their stock. We need to do the same, same thing for nutrition. So we could have a, uh, ESG metrics around nutrition. And then there's B corporation status. B corporation status is really interesting where it's a legal status where companies say to their shareholders, we're not just legally responsible to you because public companies are actually legally responsible only to their shareholders. B corporations legally extend the responsibilities to society. The largest B corporation in the United States used to be Patagonia. Uh, it's now Danone North America. Danone is, has, has become and met criteria for B corporation. And so the government could encourage and incentivize and reward a B corporation status. So I think those are all carrots. And then there's, of course, there's also sticks. I think that I agree we should have a national excise tax on soda. That just makes, makes sense. We should have voluntary and if they don't work, mandatory guidelines on additives like salt and sugar. Those things would, you know, penalize companies that aren't doing the right. So, so uh, you know, again, uh, there's a lot there and we've written a lot about this and happy to go into more detail. But at, but at a high level, you know, the federal government has always selected industries that it wants to advance and, and um, uh, 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 stimulate. And, you know, I think food sh should be should be high, high on the list of priorities. Okay, thank you. Um, we also received several questions um, around the stigma around the term obesity or around the concept of obesity. So maybe Ms. Fink, you could start um, with your experiences and how you um, manage to have an effective way of having these conversations in a school setting without children or their families feel like the, like certain kids are being singled out? Um, and, and how did you gain buy-in around those issues in schools? Well, I've been doing this for almost 20 years now, and we did start off poorly in public health, talking about obese people and obesity. And as we've learned more, we've changed our language and Really what we work on now is helping every child grow up in a healthy weight or every student grow up in a healthy weight. And we found that that, that language and people having obesity or people with obesity has really framed our conversation and made it more, uh, <clears throat> more practical for our partners that don't work in public health at the level that, that we, we do in it. And the conversations have come easier, I think, once we shifted our language. And we did start off, um, you know, in 2004, our, we were the Obesity Prevention and Control Program. And we have rebranded our program as the Physical Activity and Nutrition Program. And I think that also helps bring people to us Dr. Peterson, do you have anything to add on that? And the way CDC um, approaches the language around the issue? Yeah, I think Carol gave a great answer. I really want to emphasize to people that we don't call people diabetics anymore. So we call, we, we say people have diabetes, but when I trained in medicine, we still call people diabetics. So it's the same thing with obesity. It's person first language. You don't say that that is an overweight or ob obese person. It's a person struggling with obesity so or ha that has overweight so it's very awkward but it does help with um, signifying that 
it's not a victim. It's not a blame. There's no blame for this person. It is very difficult. I saw another question in the chat box just about how do providers do this better and, and how are we um, having access to, to kids who need to um, have the opportunities to be involved with the preventive service of pediatric weight management interventions and not make them shame. So it's a great topic and we are working slowly step by step to make sure that we do not blame people for their weight status. Yeah, and I think we, that's what we really try to emphasize in the report is about the social determinants of obesity and, and giving everyone the opportunity to be healthy. Um, okay, and Dr. Dr. Gro I'm sorry, go ahead, Darn. Yeah, can I just add to that? I think the mental health uh, uh, arena is also quite um, informative here because at this, you know, we have learned to not you know, shame people with mental health as real disease. Uh, um, but at the same time, we don't say, well, you just don't have depression or you just don't have bipolar disorder. It's okay to be depressed. It's okay. No, no, we recognize it's a disease. And so I think there has been a very appropriate pushback on, on shaming or blaming of, of, of people who have obesity or overweight. But I think there's also been a recent trend of saying it's okay to be overweight or obese, and we should be happy and delighted and fine with that. And I think that's not okay. You know, it is, it is a serious condition that's devastating to people. And so we have to find that balance where we recognize it's a disease, uh, we deal with it, we recognize it's a societal problem, it's a systems-wide problem, it's not the individual's fault. When, you know, two-year-olds are obese, it's not the individual's fault, mm -hmm. right? But I don't think, I think, you know, I, I've also seen recently, again, there's been this push to just stop talking about obesity. And I think that's a mistake. Right. We need to give children a shot. And then there's definitely a lot of communities where they're not even given a shot uh, to be healthy. Um, Dr. Gracia, maybe last question for you is the, the state of obesity report has been published annually for, for nearly two decades, I think 18 years. So what patterns have, have persisted, what themes have persisted, and how do you think the um, COVID-19 pandemic has, uh, may change um, the way we address obesity in the future? Yeah, thank you, Dar, for that important question. And, and I think it, it uplifts many of the points that all of our panelists have been talking about um, throughout this briefing. Um, just seeing the, the growing and increasing rates uh, of obesity, both among adults as well as children over time, um, but a greater appreciation, recognition, and sense of urgency that we have with regards to the need to address systems and conditions and social determinants as we think about how to advance policies that can truly lead to sustainable uh, and sustained uh, sustained and systematic uh, changes. You know, we are not, as, you, as you've been hearing in, in some of these more recent comments, as a nation, we are not funding uh, and providing resources for prevention and public health, and that includes in obesity prevention to the magnitude and scale of the problem. And so we must really uh, assure that we're increasing, and, and that's where our recommendations in, in the 18th uh, annual report for state of obesity, increasing uh, uh, federal funding, uh, to support evidence-based obesity prevention programs. We've heard as examples of uh, what's happening in Alaska and other states uh, where we can actually address uh, obesity uh, and uh, obesity rates and, and disparities. To also looking at access and ensuring that everyone has equitable access uh, really for healthy and nutritious foods, uh, that we're removing those obstacles and barriers, and that this is a multi-sectoral issue. This is not solely public health or healthcare. Uh, but many sectors, education and transportation, housing uh, and others, the private sector that have a role to play as it relates to assuring that everyone can attain a healthy weight, maintain a healthy weight, and that that promotes health and well-being. And that truly uh, what we are learning and seeing in the context of this pandemic, we have seen the worsening of many chronic conditions in, in the pandemic and included inclusive of mental health and well-being. Uh, and that this should be a clarion call uh, for us as a nation to prioritize health, prioritize prevention, and prioritize equity, uh, which is really assuring that everyone has a fair and just opportunity to be as healthy as possible. So that's we are, all of our questions, so you can close it out. Thanks. Yes, we are now at the at the end of our uh, of our briefing today, and and as you can tell, so much interest, uh, and we really want to thank our panelists uh, for. Uh, these great insights, uh, not only for the data and information, but clear examples, policies, and recommendations uh, of how we as a nation can truly address uh, the obesity crisis. Uh, we encourage you to um, share the resources that, that we have shared in the chat and the recording uh, and slides and additional resources are also going to be made available 
on TIFA's website at tifa.org in the coming days. So please stay tuned for that. We will share those resources. But again, please join me in thanking uh, our panelists today and thank you all. Thank you all for your commitment and dedication uh, so that we truly uh, can achieve health and well-being for our nation. Thank you. And that concludes today's briefing.